Cream. I could have just spoken about this, but anyway, we're prepared. So thank you all for coming today. And it, Frank Callow, I worked with him about, was it um, in the 90s? And I did a play called A Woman Who Was a Red Deer Dressed for a Deer Dance. And I was a spirit woman at that time. And he had asked me to be in this festival, but I hadn't been really been doing much acting recently. I've been doing a lot of talks on angels in the past couple of years, and still was painting, doing a couple of acting jobs. But uh, so he asked me, well, I could sh that I could show my artwork, which I thought was fabulous. So you could see my paintings here. And then I was guided to take advantage of the mic, <laughs> so and give a talk, give a talk about my paintings. Though to talk about these paintings, it might take five minutes. And then I was guided to go a little deeper. In the past couple of years, in talking about angels and healing, I've been talking about my life and how listening to my intuition, listening to guidance, I've been able to alleviate stress, but mostly be happy and healthy. So the, the um, paintings are called Tandra. And Tandra is also similar to the word Tantra. Many of us know the word Tantra, which is about um, sex, sexuality, Kundalini. But Tandra is a deep meditation state. That place right between deep sleep, when, right when you wake up. And for many of us, that's when we have psychic visions. You may have memories of something in the past and the future, but it's an incredible moment of deep, deep intuition. Now this is back in 1993 that I did these paintings, and I've only been working with the angels in the past couple of years. So right before I go into talking a little bit more about those paintings, the title, Doors of Perception. You now when I was, um, I came to New York City in 1977, June 1st, so hence the music. That was my life, Saturday Night Fever. I even got engaged to get married. I don't think you knew that, honey. <laughs> and quickly, one month later, got unengaged. It was quite an interesting time period. And I had come here right after college. And so Doors of Perceptions is about, um, this phrase is, comes from William Blake, the poet. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. All my life, little did I know, I had always been seeking, seeking what was life, what is the meaning of life, who am I? And I'll, I'm going to be going through this with my, how do I say, my journey in how I got to paintings about peacefulness, Tandra being a state of deep peace and relaxation. I'm going to assert that most of us don't walk around unless we're able to do yoga every day, meditate continuously, and kind of live in a box in New York City. But to attain peace, and many of us know, there's something called enlightenment. Some of us seek it, some of us read about it, and some of us may even have experienced it. So Doors of Perception was a book that I bought by Aldous Huxley. Little did I know that the title is the same of which the band is um, called The Doors. I didn't know The Doors and Doors of Perception. Um, so, um, I've always been seeking, and what you're going to find is that these paintings today that I do, and working with the angels, is a high vibrational state. A state of, for the most part, um, being peaceful. I'm going to kind of go back to that word. Did I start out that way? Absolutely not. <laughs> and that's going to be my journey. I'm going to show you how I use painting. I use drawing as my vehicle, as my security to get through life. And we're, I have some slides to show you with that. So here we go. And you can go to the next one. So I was born in Japan after um, the Korean War. My mother met my father there in 1953. At that time, the Americans were pretty much still enemies with Japan. My mother's pregnant. My father's told by the U.S. government not to marry my mother. He was uh, told that it'd be better if we were just left to stay in Japan as Amerasians. And this is 1954. 
My father pursued, uh, he was determined, and in the course of six months, he was able to get the documentation so that he could bring my mother and myself to the United States. This began of my life. And so in the beginning part of my life, the American side of my family wanted nothing to do with us. And the Japanese side of the family, hell no, wanted nothing to do with Americans. And this lasted about seven years. My mother was extremely depressed having come to the United States, yet she knew it was a way out of poverty. After the war in Japan, there was very little food. There was very um, little money. So many of the women got jobs on the Air Force base with their cleaning. They were maids. And she and a lot of other her, of her girlfriends worked on these bases, and they met their future husbands. And then they came to the United States. <clears throat> they were treated much like blacks. The Japanese women were, had to use the other bathroom, the non-white. So there was a heavy amount of racism and discrimination that I grew up with. And that made me who I was at that time. Because I'm going to say I was. I did find some new doors. And when I use the word entitled doors of perception, there are times in our, in our life that doors are presented. So we can have these obstacles, like my, the obstacle that my father had, the obstacle that my mother had, the obstacle that I faced growing up. Many of us don't know, and I learned much later, that we have a choice. That there's truly a choice in the matter of our lives. Things happen to us, but at the same time, we can use a creative aspect of ourselves, which is available. But unfortunately, many of us never learn that. Many of us have something happen, a situation, a circumstance, and we stay within, outside that door. So the opportunity to turn a handle and open a door, usually in uncertainty, usually at a risk, and step through and discover something new, discover peace. So going back to this, this is a painting I did of myself that was taken from a two by two brownie photograph, brownie cameras that were uh, used a lot in the 50s. And my father took the photograph and I began doing autobiographical paintings when I came to New York City in 1977. For me, it was a healing to look at myself, to look at my life, and to almost elevate it from what I had experienced. I'm only going to be giving you a brief synopsis of what I went through, but what I want to say is that by the time I was in high school and graduated, I went to 13 schools. So about every two years or quicker, we moved. So I pretty much lived out of boxes. I didn't know who, um, where we were going to go next, and I didn't have the security of long-lasting friendships or even getting to know my relatives. So that began a, a sensation in my body and my life of not belonging, being terrified, and using art. Like every time I moved, I knew if I could draw, which came naturally to me, I could get approval, I could make friends. And I drew my way through life. I could draw all the wives of Henry VIII, or I could draw all the plant biology, or amoebas and protozoa, I could just draw anything. It was my meditation, it was my security, and no matter where we moved, I knew I could always paint and draw. And here we go to the next slide, please. So the Tantra paintings that you saw when you came in, if you saw them in the lobby or here, have to do with later on in my life. And then I'm gonna flip right back. But what you see here, the white represents that which never changes. That purity, that consciousness, that is spirit that is in all of us, regardless of where we were born, regardless of where, whether or not we went to school, not school, whether we have money, whether we have degrees, no degrees, it doesn't matter. It is that which never changes. The brown part represents earth, the, the um, reality. The colored sections represent planes, the planes of existence, whether it's your house, whether it's your school, whether it's your community. But the white is constant. And that spirit, we often, it, the formation of it, looks like it's modeled by our circumstances. So here are some other examples of these paintings. And sometimes I use a touch of color to represent the red here, sexuality. 
in the next painting. And here you can see the ochre, the yellow ochre and the brown again represent earth. Again. These paintings are a series of 12, and I have eight of them here. And this painting I gave to my acting teacher. Now, when I was going, growing up, so you, you got that I was um, scared, didn't know who I was, didn't have the familial connections of uh, family <laughs> or even friends, you would never, I would never suspect or believe that I'd ever be talking in front of a group of strangers. So I went through school, through life, through college without speaking. I was a dancer in college, so I didn't have to speak. I did not use my voice. My father and my mother, we, are, we have a fabulous relationship today. But back when I was younger, I was embarrassed of them. They didn't have an education. My father was an alcoholic. And today, again, we are very um, close. We're, everything's been healed. But it was a time in which I much preferred to move away from them. They're in Ohio. I'm in New York. This is great. <laughs> you know? But I didn't under at that time, I didn't understand their... Um, I wasn't able to be in their shoes. All I knew was that I was living a life that I didn't like, scared to death, and let me just get good grades and push through, and maybe something good will happen. <laughs> and as we discovered, or I discovered, good grades doesn't always matter. Straight A's doesn't necessarily mean that you feel good inside. Being in an honor society doesn't necessarily help you in life. So I didn't have the self-esteem, so I just did my best to be the best that I could be. And even that, there was a vacuum. So I go to Ohio State, I become a dancer, I diet my way to almost anorexia, <laughs> to the point I'm fat, I look fabulous, I'm dancing fabulous, and I'm blacking out on stage because I'm not eating enough. So the thing that I care about the most at the time, which is my art form, my dance, I can't even do because I'm afraid I'm going to die. We weren't brought up to get counseling. We weren't brought up to talk about our problems with anybody. So I just kept moving forward. This painting I gave to my acting teacher because she helped me learn how to stand in front of people and be literally emotionally naked, how to bring forth my voice. And mind you, before those classes, I would be nauseous. I would be ready to throw up. I would cry. I might be shaking. I remember the very first acting scene I did, which was fold laundry and talk at the same time. And I'm like, how do people do this? How do they fold laundry and talk at the same time? And I'm crying. I can remember it was like yesterday. But I was guided. That was a door that came to me. The door said, you really want to step out of yourself, out of just being a painter, out of just being a thin dancer. There's something that wants to come forward and it's your voice. So this um, I gave to my acting teacher. So next slide. And then when I come to New York City in 1977, on June 1st, I, I really want to dance. I really want to perform. I had had a scholarship, I had gone to Jacob's Pillow as a scholarship student, I'd done the whole thing, but I had absolutely no um, confidence. And I share this because the door that I saw at that time was, the door of perception was that I wasn't good enough. Being brought up Amerasian, having seen my father do domestic violence and physical violence on my brothers, the shame that I had, I couldn't carry that anymore, I couldn't hide it. I couldn't diet myself thin enough to even look good on the outside and show up. You know, something had happened where I couldn't fake it anymore. And I also had learned about alcohol, which I hadn't used in high school. I learned, oh, God must have brought us this wonderful drink to relax us, because boy, am I relaxed when I have a drink. And yeah, it was a wonderful thing because I didn't have the, the fear in my body. I didn't have the sense of, yeah, the terror. And so I'm in New York City and the next slide. Um, 
I don't audition. I go to a couple class, dance classes and I paint. Though, but I painted furiously. I painted from nine to six every day for about two years. No cell phones at that time. I don't even think we used our answering machine. It was just total immersion, not speaking to anyone, just painting every day and drawing. I'm living in a, in a loft downtown between Duane and Reed on West Broadway. And the, everyone in that loft, all the lofts, were painters. So it was an exciting time of just painting. There were clubs that we went to in and around here in the East Village. We went out dancing. I would work as a cocktail waitress at night, and it was really exciting times. So as that was going on, I'm looking at who I really was. And this was also taken from a photograph that my father took of me when I was nine. My father and I didn't talk hardly at all when I was growing up because he was working a night job in the Air Force in communications. Then he'd come home and sleep and then coach Little League for my three brothers. We barely talked. Even though I knew he loved me, he was just part of that um, tradition and culture of men. Wasp men, Scotch-Irish, just didn't share very much. And my mother was really depressed, so I just did a lot of art when I was younger. And then here I am, I'm pulled to open the door, look at photographs of my life and paint. So next slide, please. And so I begin doing autobiographical paintings. I discover museums and galleries for the very first time. Mind you, I've never seen them in person. I lived in Tokyo, I'd seen some Broadway shows there and classical theater, but I'd never seen an art museum. And so I begin to see how other artists put emotions on canvas, how they were able to pour their life stories on canvas. And um, it's, it's an exciting time for me. And in the evening, I'm also discovering a little bit more, some new drinks, some new more alcoholic beverages. So next slide. Here's a painting of my father, myself, and my mother. So I didn't really feel this growing up, though now when I look back, it was there, not in the door, in the perception that I may have wanted. And I often wondered what other kids were doing in the United States when we were in Japan. You know, back in that time, uh, the beach blanket bingo movies were popular, and the Beach Boys, and I would just fantasize what American kids were doing. And here's my father and my mother, and you can see he set the, the camera up so that he could do a, what he called a self-portrait. But I began to understand my father more and my mother by looking at these photographs. Next slide. This is a painting that I did um, about living in Tokyo during the Vietnam War. My father would take us grocery shopping on the weekend and we would pass through an intersection and go near a prison. And my father very candidly would say, oh, this is where, right here at this intersection, is where the Americans were decapitated. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> you know? And then we would see the prison doors open. And these were these prison, like 10 foot wide prison doors. And you'd see, we were really curious as children would peer into the prison. And I, to this day, can remember the smell of like decayed corpse. So this is the flavor of my early childhood. <laughs> you know, this is what's happening. This painting represents the blood of the war. When we were in social studies class in Tokyo, our assignment was to read the Stars and Stripes newspaper every day and to look at the numbers of casualties every day. That was the topic. How many dead? How many American? How many Viet Cong? And I often would wonder if they would ever come and bomb us because I was surrounded always by military guard army tanks and fighter jets flying over that would they know that I'm American because my mother's Japanese my brothers look more Asian than I do like who am I so I was concerned I was um, obsessed with who I am and also from the very start of a young age for me how much I hated the US government how much I hated war, and that also colored my personality. That was my door of how I saw the world, that it wasn't safe. So the red represents the blood, the blood that was pouring on both sides. Behind it is Meiji Shrine, which is a temple that I visited when I was six, and I actually had heard the sound of a gong, 
of Buddhist and Buddhist chanting at that time. So I had a minor moment of stillness in the midst of emotional chaos that nobody talked about. Now we didn't talk about, I didn't go up to my dad and say, you know, I really hate that you work for war because the war paid for my food on the table and for my mother's survival. Next week. Here's a painting. This is six feet by six feet. It's two of my brothers sitting on a porch. And much of what we did in our life was wait. We waited where we were going to live again. We kind of lived out of boxes. And I, I'm asserting this and, and um, repeating it to say that there's something to be said to live in one house all your life. When I met my husband and found out that he lived in one house, went to one high school, but to me it was like, how weird, you know, did that really occur? And it does. People are so lucky to have that. And here we are just kind of, this is a painting about waiting. But finding a way to be okay with it also. The tones are in, are in gray. So in this series, I did a lot of monochromatic paintings that represented the gray zone of life. Not really low, not really high, just existing. Okay, next slide. Here's a painting of my brother. This is... Um, uh, 36 by 48 inches. This is the feeling of riding and going through life, riding a bicycle, your hands off of the, the um, handlebars. There's an exhilaration, at the same time there's a terror. And there you can see I didn't paint his eyes in because it is as if we have to go through life and not know where we're going. So this is what I painted here. This is a painting of my uncle, who brought my mother to the Air Force Base that she could work at um, when she was 16. My mother was overdeveloped as a young Japanese woman, so she was easy to hide her age. And at that time, she made most of her money and would send it back to her mother. Her father had died when she was nine, so she did her best to help um, her family out. And my uncle was a saxophone player, and he also was a bartender on the Air Force Base. And in the back, you can see one of my most favorite alcoholic beverages, which I no longer have. We'll get to that. But Remy Martin, the whole line back there. So next slide, please. This is a painting that's four feet by five feet of my youngest, um, one of my brothers. And it is um, my uh, conversation about being Amerasian and wearing the American costume. And the costume is for Halloween. And, you know, we did our best to blend in. We never called ourselves Asian. We were just American. Yeah, my father is a Trump supporter, just to put that out. Um, he's Republican. And so we were just American. We didn't talk about Asian American. Little did I know that when I was in college, I was getting scholarships and I was being um, courted because I was a minority. And that was a surprise to me because I had never stopped to talk to my mother or my father that I was Japanese American. Again, I was just American, even though I was not blonde and blue eyed. So this painting here is a, a one of my passport series. Um, this painting was at the World Trade Center. On 9-11, it, it got destroyed. When 9-11 happened, it was a horrible day for all of us. This painting I had given to um, a business that I had uh, taken courses with as an acknowledgement. When 9-11 happened, it was a horrible, horrible thing. But because I had lived in what I would say war zones all my life, and I had also felt the um, frustration of being asked when I was 16 on my first date for my boyfriend's father what I thought of Pearl Harbor. So I bore the guilt of Pearl Harbor. I bore the guilt of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because I'm half Japanese, American and Japanese. So when 9-11 happened, again, a horrible thing, but as it was as if I had always been waiting for something bad to happen because I had lived in behind fences with army tanks all my life. It was as if this was part of what was going to happen. I also was studying Qigong at that time with the Chinese mystic healer. Interesting time for me. I was going to 
um, up to Columbia on the subway that morning. And I remember doing my breathing in the, in the subway, and I was extremely peaceful. And I, yeah, I just believed that I had met this gentleman and that he had helped me, knowing that some of these things may have triggered for me. For me and for many Japanese American war, and for any, it can, it can be from any country, where, or it could be for any human being who has any empathy about war and destruction. Um, it can trigger. PSTD is real. Whether you, you are in actual warfare or you are in vicinity or close to family member, it's real. Next painting. This painting is six feet by six feet. It's my mother and me. Again, taken from a two by two inch black and white photo. I rendered it very large. It took me about a month to do. And again, this time it's in the 70s. I'm working, I'm painting every day, I'm not doing anything else. I look back at that time, it was glorious. No cell phones, no social media, just making art. And partying at night. <laughs> so, so this painting um, helped reconcile my mother and my relationship. For the most part, she She's 16 when she marries my father. Not, no, when she marries, she's four years older. But she doesn't have any friends who speak English. So she puts all of her energy and all of her neg negative feelings on me. I'm the oldest. I become the housekeeper, the cook, at age six. My mother gives me permission to take my two-year-old brother to the movies. Literally, down the street, I have the money, I take him to the movies. By the time I'm eight, I'm taking care of two brothers. So I'm not getting a chance to play outside very much. So this kind of constitutes this energetic suppression of anger in my body, starting very young. But when I paint my mother here, I feel complete love. I elevate myself to a place of making it all okay making everything beautiful. Though a few years later with this painting, um, at a point after I leave this beautiful loft, which I actually got kicked out of because I was drinking too much. Here I was a very thin, much thinner than even now, uh, person and I'm learning about alcohol, but alcohol I can't control. I do some crazy things and I'm asked to leave. There I move into an apartment, but shortly after, I just move into an apartment with anybody, and this anybody person ends up physically abusing me. In a fight one evening, I take an X-Acto knife, and I start slashing this painting. And I slash it down by her skirt. It's almost knowing that I was going to do it, but I'm not going to do it too bad. And he stops me. I end up able, being able to... Um, I won't say heal, but I can actually fix the skirt so you can't tell that there is a slash because it's like a fold in her skirt. And I say this because the rage inside of me and the lack of perception of choosing the wrong people, making the wrong choices because my self-esteem had never really developed. That was what led to that point. And from there, I ended up going to my first AA meeting because what took me there was that I was um, in a physical fight with this gentleman and he was kicking me and punching me. Mind you, I probably um, started it by saying a lot of nasty things because I got very nasty when I drank. Uh, and at one moment I remember screaming for the police to help me 